Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So we're on page six. We're not on page. We're actually on page 63. Uh, but I'm going to look at page 62 because page 62 is very instructive. At the top of page 62, five lines down from the top, it says selfishness, self-centeredness. That we think is the root of our troubles, not alcohol. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, on ego. That has... which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So we tr- our troubles, we think, of our, are basically of our own making. Now, this is important because they've just, they just had page 60, 61, and the top of page 62, particularly page 61, where they talk about the actor who wants to run the whole show. And it's very, that's a very important page also. And that's why I read, read it last week with my name in there. And I challenge everybody to read that page with their name in there. So that we get to see what we actually do, particularly before we start to do a full step. And it says this is at the bottom of page 62. It says this is the how and the why of it. First of all, the why. First of all, we had to quit playing God. Why? Because it didn't work. Next, this is the how. We decided that hereafter, in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Our directors direct. And they direct. A director is a, um, like if we take a director of a movie or a director of a, of a film or a, a play, the director has an overall artistic idea about what the finished product is going to look like. The actors have to follow the director's directions in order for that to be achieved. And particularly now when we have uh, a lot of um, computer-generated stuff going on in the background on a lot of films, most of the time, the actors are acting in front of a green screen. I can't do that. Anyway, that's fine. Oh, cool. Thank you. There, there, oh, whoops. Unable to start video. Somebody's knocked my video off. Okay. Can you, you, my video's been knocked off. Somebody's done that. It doesn't matter. Start my video. There we go. Cool. That's great. Thank you. Right, bravo. All right. So the actor, the actor has to follow directions because he's got no idea. Until uh, I mean, I, I've actually spoken to some actors, and they say you know that they have a real shock when they 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 sort of got an idea about what it's going to look like, but when they see the rushes of the film. You know, like the sort of the scene that they've just they've just sort of like they've just finished a couple of days ago, and they'll see a quick clip of it, and they're they're astonished at what's going on in the background. So <clears throat> we've got to follow directions. We're not we're stop being we we stop trying to run the whole show, and we're going to follow the directions of the director, and God is going to be our director. We'll get to how we how we use that later. He is the principle. We are his agents. Agents work for principles. And so God is going to give us work to do. Well, the first work that we're going to do is step four through nine. But once we get past step nine, the work that God is going to give us to do is to go carry this message to other alcoholics. And then finally, he is the father or mother I'm very happy to have God as a mother at two o'clock in the morning when I need a hug. 
and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. This concept is the keystone, the first stone in a builder of a building, of a new and triumphal art through which we would pass to freedom. And then they tell us, then they tell us some very interesting things. If we take this, if we take this position, if we if we accept God as a creator, as a um, as a director, as a an, as a principal and a parent, it says when we sincerely took such a position, top of page sixty three, all sorts of remarkable things follow. Now this is so-called promises in the big book, but they're talking about their experience. When they stopped running the show and they started to ask for directions from this power or to align their will with God's will, it said we had a new new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed. Now, I spent most of my life up until this point when I did this when I did this third step <clears throat> trying to get stuff for me trying to get what everything I wanted but now God is going to provide for me what I need not necessarily what I want but it's going to be what I need and it's very interesting what has happened since I did that. And it said he provided what we needed, but there's a condition. If we keep close to him and perform his work well, two conditions, keep close to this power and, and do this power's work. Established on such a footing, we become less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we become interested in seeing what we can contribute to life. Now, I didn't realize, but, but only after I'd done a fourth step, and when I was doing the fifth step, was that I realized that I was a taker all of my life that I wasn't putting anything back into life at all. I just wanted everything. I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it, and I wanted it yesterday. <clears throat> and what we're going to start to do now is we're going to start to put back into life. And by doing, and doing that, that is helping other people, not myself anymore, necessarily. More and more, and this is over time. It doesn't come suddenly after making this decision. It's over time, more and more. We become interested in seeing what we contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in. Okay, so as we work through the steps, we begin to get this power and begin to begin to be conscious of this power. As we enjoyed peace of mind, that was that was a real luxury for me when I first came to my aid, was my head was very, very noisy. There was a lot of, lot of stuff going on up there. As we discovered we could face life successfully without alcohol, as we became conscious of his presence. You see, this talks much deeper as we looked in We Agnostics. This is much deeper than a belief. This is knowing that there's a power at work here, not just believing that there's a power at work. Conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. He is a huge, huge thing. We were reborn. Twice born. That's an amazing thing. I've had two lives. I've had the alcoholic life and I've had a sober life. I am reborn. I'm twice born. The sober life is nothing like my alcoholic life. Nothing like it. Even when I wasn't drinking, before I started drinking, there was something not right about me. We are now at step three. Now they've given us, the, <laughs> on page 60 in italics, they say we are at step three. They then give us three pages, <laughs> which, is, which is page 61 especially, that's, that's saying that we're running the show. And now they tell us that we are actually at step three now. And then it says, this is the step three 
decision is at the bottom of page 62. God's a director. God's the principal. God's the father or mother, whichever way you want to look at it. Spiritual parent. <clears throat> we're going to follow directions. We're going to do God's work. And we're going to have a spiritual parent that loves us unconditionally. See, one of the things that, that proved that to me was that my dad, I broke my dad's heart because he, he got drunk one time, passed out. He ended up in a blackout. He ended up waking up in the street, lying in the gutter. And he said, if I drink that much and this happens to me, I'm never going to do it again. And he never did. But he used to come around and he used to pick me up off the street. And it broke his heart. But he didn't stop loving me. And that was the amazing, that was the amazing thing. It didn't stop loving me, you know, because he told me so after, after I made amends. He told me so. He said, I couldn't understand it, but I, I had to do it because I loved you. And now if, if, if a mere mortal, my father, can love me like that unconditionally, then how much more can this power love me? The spiritual parent that wants the very best for, for, for me and for us, <clears throat> wants us close to them. So we're now at step three. Many of us said to our maker as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee. I'm going to give myself to you. To build with me and to do with me as you, thou wilt. To build with me in, in, in your image or whatever you want me to be. And to do with me whatever you want to do. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Relieve me of the slavery to my ego. The voice. The voice that I think is me in my head, which keeps on telling me to do stuff. Oh, you need to do this. Oh, you need to do that. You got to have this and you got to have that. The bondage, slavery of self that I may better do God's will, better do thy will, not mine anymore. Take away my difficulties. Now, at step three, my difficulties are everything that I come into Alcoholics Anonymous with. They're not my character defects. And I told you, I have no idea what they are yet because I haven't done fourth step yet. At step three, my difficulties are my drinking and all the drama that I come into Alcoholics Anonymous with. Take away my difficulties. That victory over them may bear witness. Be an example <clears throat> to those that I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. So I'm going to help people, but it's not going to be my power. It's going to be God's power. It's not necessarily going to be my love. It's going to be God's love. And it's not my way of life anymore. It's God's way of life now. I'm going to live God's way of life from now on. How do I know how to do that? Well, I'm going to have to work four through nine and then start to live in 10 and 11. And it accelerates, you see. This is interesting. This has got two steps in it. The next chapter's got seven. May I do thy will always. May I always do God's will. That's a hard one. It says we thought well before taking this step. Oh, hang on a minute. We've just taken it and they've, and they told us that we're supposed to think well before taking it. Making sure that we're ready, that we can at last, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to this power. It, sound, it said we found this very desirable to take the spiritual step with an understanding person. Well, they didn't have sponsors in this day, in these days when they, when they, um, when they wrote this, but they're going to give us some people that we can do it with us, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor, or add-on sponsor. 
but it is better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. The wording, of course, was quite optional, so long as we express the idea of voicing it without reservation. Okay, so they're giving us permission to write our own third step prayer. And I encourage everybody that I sponsor to do that, to make it personal, because it goes back into, goes back into we agnostics, where it says on page 47, it says your own conception right at the top of the page. It says, therefore, when we speak to you, we mean your own conception of God. This applies, too, to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not add any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms to deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. So they're saying you can rewrite this prayer as long as, make it your own, as long as it expresses the idea. And the idea is that I've made a mess. So I'm going to stop doing that and I let you guide me. I let this power guide me through life from now on. But I still don't know how to do that. It's just a decision. Now, there's a whole bunch of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that do these first three steps because there is really nothing in them. The first thing is just an admission that I'm powerless over alcohol. The second one is a willingness to believe. And the third one is a decision. Okay, but really, what's the decision? Well, there's no action in the decision. You know, it's like there's an old joke in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's three, there's three frogs sitting on a lily pad, and one of them makes a decision to jump off. How many frogs are on the lily pad? Three because he's made the decision to jump, but he hasn't jumped yet. That's it. That's only, that's what the third step is. It's just a decision. Now we're going to have to have some action. So it says, it's better to meet God alone than one might misunderstand. The wording, of course, is quite optional as long as it expressed the idea. Voicing it without reservation. That means that we say it out loud. Voicing it. Okay, so you can't say the third step prayer to yourself. It has to be out loud. And the reason why it has to be out loud is that God will hear it, but I need to hear it too. I need to hear what I'm saying to God. And my sponsor needs to hear what I'm saying to God too. And when, when someone writes their own prayer and they start to mumble it, I say, talk, speak up. I want to hear what you're saying. Voicing it without reservation. And then it says, this is only a beginning. You see, it's only a beginning. Though if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a very great one, is felt at once. And some folks think, oh, wow, yeah, I've just had a spiritual experience. Uh, no, you've got a feeling of relief is probably what it is it's maybe the beginning of a spiritual experience but it isn't what the, it isn't enough to keep you sober because now it says at the bottom of the page next we launched out on a course of vigorous action okay i used to i used to <clears throat> I used to watch ships. I used to like watching ships getting launched. Ships getting launched are quite amazing. There's several thousand tons of steel sitting on a slipway, and they knock away a few bits and pieces, and this thing starts to slide. And it's there's no way of stopping it. Once it's once it's moving, there's no way of stopping it, and it is going to go into the sea. And <clears throat> to try and stop it, they have tons of chains sort of like in big heaps hanging off the front of the front of the ship sort of being dragged along to slow it down so that it doesn't sort of break too much stuff when it hits the sea but there's a better one than that and a better one than that is watching watching one of these satellite rockets take off that sucker is doing in about in about three minutes that thing's doing a thousand miles an hour 
You know, that's launching. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be launching on a course of vigorous action. That means this is going to take effort. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. No, no way like this. So our decision was a vital and crucial step. So the decision is to take spiritual help. That's page 22. It says there's two things that we can do. There's two, there's two, two paths we can take. One was to blot out a tolerable situation as best we could. Sorry, I think it's 25. <laughs> it's 25, I beg your pardon. <laughs> it says, says one, one way with two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out and tolerable situation as best we could. Can't do that anymore. I'm going to die or go insane if I keep on doing that. The other is to accept spiritual help. That's why it's crucial. It's a, we're at a, not exactly a crossroads. It's a fork in the road. I can go blot out my intolerable situation, accept spiritual help. I'm going to accept spiritual help. How do I do that? Well, <clears throat> it says, though our decision was a vital, which is life-giving or life-preserving, or an crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Okay, there's been some stuff here that has been stopping us from contacting the power that is described in We Agnostics that is within us. Our liquor was but a symptom. Aha. We had to get down to causes and conditions. Causes and conditions of our separation from this power. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. Okay, so here we are at step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. they got to check if I have a grocery store. I gotta check my stock every every week to find out whether everything's still in date. If it's not in date, it's gotta be gotta be thrown out and I gotta get some new one. <clears throat> Taking a commercial inventory is a fact finding and fact facing process. We're gonna be looking at facts here, not feelings. It is an effort to discover the truth about, uh, about the stock in trade. And what is my stock in trade? My stock in trade is my life. So we're going to find out about our lives here. And it says one object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods. To get rid of them promptly and without regret. No emotion, no emotion attached. I can't get upset that the, that the milk is all sour in the fridge because the fridge broke down overnight. I can't sell it as yogurt. It's sour milk. It's not yogurt. I've got to throw it out, and I've got to get some fresh milk and get the, get the fridge repaired, and I mustn't be emotional about it. It's going to cost me money, but that's just one of those things. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. No point in hanging on to hanging on to sour milk. No use to anybody. Get rid of it. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly, truthfully. That's why it's called moral inventory. It's a truthful inventory. It's not about feelings anymore. It's not about what I think anymore. It's the facts. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. Our failure to live life without alcohol. Being convinced that self, ego, Manifested in various ways, the ego is a shapeshifter. The ego is an actor. The ego has masks. It's not just one person. There's more than one of us here. We can play, we can be different people to different people. (laughs) 
being convinced of self, convinced. I'm going to be convinced of that. Well, I will be after I've done a fourth step. Manifested in various ways of what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestation. So we're going to look for how the ego shows up in our lives. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else, even alcohol. Sober alcoholics for many years can die because of a, of a resentment. I've seen it happen in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've seen people get really sick with resentment. Meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, years sober usually end up drinking. <clears throat> resentment, a number one offender, it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. Okay, so what's resentment? Well, resentment comes from Latin. It comes from a verb sentire, which is to feel. And the prefix re, sentire, re means to revisit, go back to, or again. And so it's about re-feeling things. Resentment is re-feeling something that has happened in the past over and over again. And some of those feelings that I have from the past are things that I have done in the past that I feel guilty about or ashamed of. Some of them, um, uh, what's that, I'm, I'm muted there. No, thank you. We've got to listen carefully to this because there's a hell of a lot of stuff in these next two pages, okay? And so resentment can be not just anger, it can be revisiting stuff that's happened to us in the past. And then it says, resentment is number found, it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it, from resentment. Form stems all forms of spiritual disease. Aha, they're telling us something new. Alcoholism, they're not talking about alcoholism anymore. Alcoholism is an inability to control our drinking when we drink and the inability to stop ourselves from drinking when we're not drinking. It's got nothing to do with the spiritual malady. The solution is finding the spiritual malady and overcoming it, and we now don't need to drink any. Alcohol is our solution to the spiritual malady. The spiritual malady is the human condition. It is not specific to alcoholics. Everyone, every human being, is separated from the power greater than themselves. That is the spiritual malady, the feeling of separation from this power that is within. There are many paths in many different cultures to try and overcome that. They call religion or spiritual paths. We have one here in 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, a spiritual path to overcome the sense of separation from the power within us. Alcohol made me feel like I was, that I was connected until it didn't work anymore and I just got drunk. But in the beginning, it, was, it worked. So it says here, we've been spiritually sick. It says we have not, been, not, not only been mentally and physically ill, alcoholism, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Uh -huh. So if we work on the spiritual, the actual physical and mental part of alcoholism goes away. In dealing with the resentments, we set them on paper. So the first thing you need to do on a fourth step is to get some paper. Okay, so that's the first thing, get some paper. Now, what I like to do, I don't think I've got it in front of me. Oh, I can 
You get it, huh? Because I like I like the guys that I do fourth step or do step work with to get themselves a spiral spiral notebook or some kind of some kind of exercise book. Eh? Really good. And a pen. Because <laughs> we're gonna write stuff down. So it says, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Okay. I don't like I don't like computer computer stuff. I don't like spreadsheets. I don't like that. I want it written. There's a power in writing. The power is that the brain is operating the hand and the thoughts that go on the paper have to pass through the heart to get onto the paper. We are making marks on paper. It is a very spiritual thing to do. Then it said we listed. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is make a list. I'm breaking this down into little pieces, okay? So we've got a piece of paper, and we're going to make a list. So what are we going to make a list of? We're going to make a list of people. We're going to make a list of institutions, schools, hospitals, psychiatric units, um, whatever. Principles, religions, the law morals, whatever, with whom we were angry. That's the first form of resentment they're going to list, anger. Highlight it. <clears throat> we asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll explain what these are in a moment when we get on the next page. Our pocketbooks our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt. There's another form of resentment. Hang on a minute, I've got to shut the door because the wind is coming up and it's banging the door. That's what happens here in the afternoons. Okay, hurt. So that's a form of resentment. I feel hurt. Somebody has hurt me in the past. Or threatened. Now, threatened is imagined. They haven't actually done it yet. I just think they're going to do it. Okay, so somebody's going to, somebody's going to, I think somebody's going to harm me. That's being threatened. But it hasn't happened yet. So I'm making it up in my mind. So we were sore. Okay, sore is just being miserable about it. Low grade. Bleh. We were burned up. That's rage. That's another form of resentment. There's two types there. There's slow burn miserableness about whatever's going on in my life. And then there's rage, throwing stuff across the room. On our grudge list, there's another form of resentment holding a grudge against somebody. Somebody did something to me 20 years ago, and I still remember it. Every time I think of somebody's name, I uh, bastard. <laughs> On our grudge list, we step opposite each name, our injuries. How did they injure us? That's another form of resentment. Was it our self-esteem? Okay, our, my self-esteem is my best idea of who I am. Who do I think I am? When I look at myself in the mirror, who do I think I am? What's my idea of me? That's my self-esteem. Now, my self-esteem is never stable. It goes all over the place. Sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's so high it's the size of a small planet. But it's, it's, it flows. <laughs> and sometimes I actually wear a mask that my self-esteem turns out to be somebody that isn't really me. 
Very interesting. My security. Okay, and so the next next thing they have here was our self-esteem was our security. Now that can be that can be um, physical security. It can be financial security. It could be emotional security. It could be spiritual security. I know people who are spiritual vampires. You talk to them for 15 minutes and you come away drained. Our ambitions, very simple. What's my ambition? What do I want? What I want. My personal or sex relations. My personal relations with everybody that I know. From my parents to my friends. Sex relations is my significant other. Or others. That we're not the arbiters of anybody's sex life. Entirely up to you. I'm not interested. Which have been interfered with. Oh, there's a very <laughs> subtle form of resentment. I was I was always thinking that the that the income tax were the people who was in, who were interfering with my money. They were always interfering. I wanted all this money. They kept on taking it away from me, and they were interfering with my money and my ambitions. They went down on the list. And then it says. We were usually as definite as this example. So when we get this, when we get this, 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 this book, this this notebook, okay, this um, this here exercise book. The first thing we do is the left hand, the left hand page. We fold it over to make a column. We make a fold. So it makes a column in the middle of the page. Can you see that? So now you've got two columns on the left-hand page. If we do the right-hand page, we can put down a fold on the right-hand page, and now we have two columns on the right-hand page, and the spine is the, between the two middle columns. Okay? So this is very important because now we're going to just use the first two columns. And we're going to do what it says on page 65, and we're going to write it down exactly the same way as they did it there. Okay? And there are three columns. There was a gentleman in Boulder, Colorado, called Big Frank McKay. Big Frank was a very sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and a big book thumper. And he was a sheep farmer, about six foot five, who turned into a lawyer. Don't, I, don't, I, don't ask how that happened. And <clears throat> there's another gentleman who's actually very, very ill now that was his sponsee. Um, his, uh, Bob, a guy called Bob, Bob Olson, Bob O. And Bobo, unfortunately, is in hospital right now and he's receiving chemo and he's very, very ill, um, which is very sad because Bob's a great guy. And Bob used to say he was never frightened of anybody except Frank. And Big Frank does a thing about the fourth step. And Big Frank says, I'm going to quote Big Frank. This is not me, okay? Big Frank says... If anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous thinks that there's more than three columns in a fourth step, they are educated beyond their intelligence. There are three columns, and they're on page 65. Okay, that's it. All right? So I know we can go online and we can get sheets, and there will be four columns, and there'll be seven columns, and there'll be oh, oh, another sheet with more columns. There's only three. Okay, and this is this is the analysis. Okay, this is the analysis of how we think. And it says we're usually as definite as this example. Now, after making the list, so we make a list first on a separate piece of paper, and we scribble down all the names that we can think of and the people that we're angry at or have hurt us or threatened us or we've got a grudge against or have injured us. We just write them down. And we ask God to show us, is there any, any that I need to see? 
and we spend 10 minutes scribbling them down, just the names. And then we, we put that away till later on in the day. Then we go back to it and say, please, God, show me what else I need to see on my resentment list. And we start writing again. We put some more down. And we put some institutions down. And we put some, some, um, some principles down. And then we do that for a couple of days until we end up with a list of names. And then we take one name and put it in the left-hand column, Mr. Brown. And alongside Mr. Brown, we write what he did to us that makes us resentful towards him. Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife, one. Two, told my wife about my mistress. Three, Brown may get my job at the office. There are three resentments there against Mr. Brown. Okay? Now, they're not stories, notice. They are statements. And it is very important that in the second column, you write them as statements. His attention to my wife. Well, that could be an episode of a, a soap opera. In fact, those three put together could be a whole season of a soap opera. Told my wife about my mistress. Oh, my God. And that is huge. And Brown may get my job. Now, Brown is threatening him there. You see, it's not real. Brown may get my my job at the office. Is this resentment real or is it imagined? Is it real? Am I being hurt or am I being threatened? And we only do the first two columns. We go to the next one. On this example, it's Mrs. Jones. Now, if we count the number of words, this comes from Don, Don Fritz, Don P, from, uh, also from Boulder, Colorado. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen words in the first resentment. That's the longest one of, of all the examples there. Don P used to say, any resentment you have, you've got nineteen words. We can negotiate around the twentieth, but I've never given it away yet. The whole point is that we don't write a story. Because if we write a story, it's going to reinforce the resentment. We're making statements. Okay? We're keeping it very short. Mrs. Jones, this is a short one. She's a nut. She snubbed me. Oh, she, did. <laughs> she didn't say hello the other morning. <laughs> I mean, that's lovely that's so, that is so alcoholic she didn't talk to me yesterday she ignored me she, she committed her husband for drinking okay so now he's afraid that the that he's, his, his missus is going to lock him away as well he's my friend she's a gossip she's talking to my wife my wife might be getting an idea that i get locked up for, for habitual drinking He's employer. Okay, so that's the end of, end of Mrs. Jones. Now, the employer, unreasonable, unjust, overbearing. Wow. Threatens to fire me for drinking. I love that one. So <laughs> you're drunk on the job. What do you expect? Well, I mean, you've got to give me a bit of latitude, haven't you? And, and padding my expense account. Okay, so he's stealing from the he's stealing from the company basically. Yeah, he's got a resentment about it. That's very alcoholic. And then finally, this one again could go into a soap opera. Is my wife misunderstands? Oh, she doesn't understand me, but my mistress does. You see, <laughs> likes Brown. Oh, that's dangerous. Wants the house put in her name. Oh, right. Okay. So it looks like I'm going to get, I'm going to get kicked out. Brown's going to move in and I'm going to be homeless. That's the resentment. 
Okay. Now, when we've got our list and we take each name on our list and we put it on the left hand column, so we put them down on the left hand column, one there, make a space, put the resentments alongside of it. Next name off the list. Put it in there, put the resentments alongside of it. Next name off the list, put it there, put the resentments alongside of it. Don't go across, go down. When you've come to the end of your, of your list, you can now go to the top again on the third column. Now, so we open up the book. So we've got the first two columns here. Now we go on the third column and we write our it effects, what it affects, what areas of self it affects. And it comes from, we don't have to, we don't have to invent any. The third column comes from the list on page 65, where it says on our grudge list, two or three lines down from the top, opposite each name, our injuries. Was it our self-esteem? who I think I am, my security of any kind, my ambition, what I want, my personal relations, or my sex relations have been interfered with. But there's one that he really sneaks in. And it's right at the bottom in the third column, the first word of the last resentment, pride. And so add pride to that, to that list at that top there, because pride is self-esteem on steroids. Pride, <clears throat> self-esteem is me saying to myself, this person shouldn't treat me like this. They should treat me better. Don't they know who I am? They should treat me better. Pride is not only should they treat me better, but people should not see them treating me in this way. That's pride. Okay, It's saying that, look at me, I am so, this wonderful person, and this person is treating me in this way, and people can see it, and it's affecting my pride. And it's extremely dangerous to alcoholics, I've got to tell you. Because I listen to a lot of, a lot of um, and I've done it myself, uh, listen to a lot of um, uh, fourth steps from folks who have been sober a while. And one of the things that shows up all the time is pride. And I, I did a, I had a, a few years ago, I had um, uh, quite, a, quite a, a complicated problem. There were several problems that, that all the crap hit the fan all at the same time. And I did this inventory and I sent it to my sponsor and we do, we, we, we do, I'm doing a, four, a fifth step with him. And he kept on saying, go back to the fourth column. And I said, but we're supposed to be doing the, doing the other, doing the other bit. And he said, well, no, the so-called fifth and fourth column. He said, go, go back to the third column. And I, I said, okay. So I went back to the third column. He said, what do you see? And on every one of them, I put pride. And not only did I put pride, but I put pride in capital letters. And I hadn't seen it until he pointed it out. So the third column is important because one of the things about the third column is where we play the actor. It's where we play a part, where we, we are a personality that is being affected. There was a, a long time ago, I'm not going to go into it now because it's not really Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, Mark Houston and Joe Hawke, uh, two wonderful teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous, used to do something around the third column thought, called the theatre of the lie. And it's really interesting. It's about all the different characters that are within us that can be offended and each one of those characters has self-esteem, that has security, has ambition, has personal relations and sex relations. It's very interesting, but it's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is just a simple fourth step. So we end up by writing in the third column what areas, what those areas of self affect are affected. So we end up with three columns of writing exactly the same way as we have in front of us. Okay which means 
that we have three columns and one blank column now on our on our on our page. So we've got the left hand column with the names, we've got what they did, why am I resentful, and the areas of self, self-esteem, pride, and the third column. The fourth column is blank. Okay. Then it says we went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. So once I've got all the immediate ones down, I then go back through my life. So I go back for the first five years, I go back one year at a time. After five years, I go back in five-year tranches. Okay, is there anything happened the five years before that that I still think or still makes me feel uncomfortable today? It's not necessary to identify what it is that you feel. It's just discomfort in some way. <clears throat> I had some embarrassing things that happened that I did when I was when I was younger, and they kept on popping up, and so I put them down. There was something that showed up in the last inventory when I had this thing with pride, in the last inventory, which I which was amazing because I've done inventory a lot. I've been sober. I was, at that time, I was sober. <sighs> Well, it was six years ago, okay? So it was, I was 34 years sober. So the – and what, what happened was that I was looking through and I could – there was something There was something that wasn't, wasn't quite right, and I, I prayed about it and I sat with it, and all of a sudden it came to me that it was a regret. And it was a very deep regret, and it was a regret that I got divorced from my first wife and it was me that drove it and it was a regret. And that was like 40 years ago. And I'd carry that regret with me until six years ago. And I didn't even know it was there, which is the reason why I like to do fourth steps on a regular basis. You don't do just one. I do them regularly. And it's like, it's like peeling an onion. And this was so buried, this was so buried that it didn't come to the surface until that particular, what that happened, that which there was a, it was a very emotional time. There was a, there was, I'm not going to go into it, but there were several things that happened all at the same time. And I, I was, I was dis, distraught completely. And the only solution to that is do inventory, find out what it is in me that is affected which is blocking me from a power greater than myself. I couldn't access this power. I was angry. So I've got to find out what it is. So I write it down. And what we end up here with these three columns is an analysis of how we think. It's the old way of thinking. This person did this to me. This is what it affects. This is, makes me miserable. This makes me upset. This makes me angry. My self-esteem, my relations my sexual relations, my security, my personal relations, they all, it makes me angry. And then alongside of all those things is fear, in brackets. We're going to look at fear when we've looked at the rest of us. Now we get to page 66. It says, we looked, we went back through our lives, nothing counted with honesty, with thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, the three columns, when we're finished, we considered it carefully. So we're going to look at these three columns and consider it carefully. The first thing apparent, the third column, was this world and its people are often quite wrong. Okay, so this is how I look at them. This guy did this. This Mr. Brown is doing this to me. He is wrong. I am right. He's wrong. And it says, and if, the, if he's wrong, then I'm right, you see. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. That's what the three columns are, are showing us, showing us that this is how we think. This is where we get wronged. The third column is where we get wronged, where we get upset. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore because we keep on going to the third column and looking at all those things in ourselves that are affected. My self-esteem's affected. My pride's affected. My sex relations are affected. All those things affected. They're not treating me right. 
life doesn't treat me right. These people are wrong. They shouldn't be doing this to me. There's no solution here. This is just an analysis of the way we think. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. If we stay in those three columns, we're going we're to be like this the rest of our lives. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore ourselves. And I say to the people I sponsor, you can put yourself down on the, on the list, but you're not going to make amends to yourself. But you can put your name down on the list. <clears throat> If I'm sore at myself, I get to a place, if I'm really deeply, deeply disturbed about myself, I get to a place where I actually want to leave. And that's where people commit suicide. Once, and, but the more we fought and tried to have our way, in other words, we want to change what the people are doing in the second column so that I feel okay in the third column, So we're fighting to change what they're, what they're doing in the second column. It says the more we tried that, the worse it got, because they're not going to change. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Great example about victors, about, about, um, about victors just, just almost um, seeming to win. <clears throat> Japan was destroyed at the end of the Second World War. Destroyed, totally. The, the emperor was no longer a god. I mean, that was the core of, their, core of their society. Yet in a few years, they were the electronic and car manufacturers of the world. They made more cars than Detroit. There are more Japanese cars in the United States than there are American-made cars. They only seem to win. Same thing happened in Germany. <clears throat> Our moments of triumph are short-lived. It is plain, and page 66 is very important. It's called the bridge between our old way of thinking and a new way of thinking. It is plain, and I turn that into a question, because that's a statement. And after looking at those three columns, I've got to ask myself, is it plain to me that life that includes deep resentment leads to only futility and unhappiness? If I stay in those resentments, I'm going to be unhappy for the rest of my life. To the precise extent that we permit these resentments, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Well, yes, because I, I sit around on a bar stool generally, telling everybody about how bad my life is and how badly people treat me. I could go on for hours. But with the alcoholic whose hope, that is, hope of not dying or going insane, is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. They've just buried us. We found that it is fatal. Well, if you look at the implication of, of the hope, grave and fatal, they just killed us three times. For when harboring such feelings of resentment, harboring them, <clears throat> I used to own a small yacht, small sailing boat. 34-foot rival, lovely boat, one of the first fiberglass boats that they were made, lovely, lovely boat, sailed itself. And I used to have it in a harbour. And I used to go ashore, I used to live on it as well, but I used to go ashore and I used to spend weeks away from it. And it didn't matter what the this, what this weather outside of the harbour was, I knew that my boat was safe because it was in a harbour. And what they're saying that we do with these resentments is that we keep them safe, that we don't lose them. That we've, we've got like, it's almost like I've got, a, I've got a filing cabinet in the back of my head. And that when somebody walks into my life, I get their dossier out. 
and I open up the dossier and I will tell you everything bad they've done to me or even the things I think they've done to me or the things that I'm thinking that I think they're thinking of doing to me. That's how keeping them safe. And then when they go, I'll put it back in the, in the dossier again and wait until the next time. So, we found it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, keeping them safe, listen to this, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. We do it. Nobody else, not them. We do it. We do it to ourselves by holding resentment towards these people. Now, it's not, it's, if it was nighttime, I could demonstrate something about how how it looks i i might be able to i'm not sure i can do it no it's too much light <clears throat> i have a desk lamp i might be able to do it if i show you the desk lamp there's the desk lamp okay i'm just going to get something i'll be back in a second I should have got these. I should have got these before because now this is a demonstration. You see this, this lamp. This lamp is my spirit. Okay, and it's alive and well within me. When I have a resentment, it's like putting a tea towel over over the lamp. Now you can see the light from the lamp still but it's not as clear as it was before i get another resentment oh another resentment it's not as bright as it was still see it though i get another resentment this is a big resentment this one just about see the light Another resentment. You can't see the light anymore. That's what happens with resentments. Resentments stop us from seeing the light within us. What the fifth step does and the fourth step does is it removes the resentments that are stopping me from seeing the light within. It's as simple as that. Everything in the first three columns is blotting out the light that's within me that I need contact with in order to stay sober. That's the whole point of the 12 steps. It works better in the dark. <laughs> but that's what resentments are doing. Resentments are layering between my head and my heart. The heart is the place, I believe, my heart is the place where the spirit resides. The ego resides up here. The ego blocks me off from the heart. Somebody once said in Alcoholics Anonymous, the furthest an alcoholic ever has to travel is about 18 inches from the head to the heart. That's the furthest we have to go. The insanity of alcohol returns. I'm halfway down page 66. The insanity of alcohol returns. And we drink again. The insanity of alcohol is thinking about drinking, not drinking. Drinking is the craziness afterwards, but the insanity is, I've been sober a while. Ah, life don't treat me right. What the hell? I'm going to drink. That's the insanity. And with us to drink is to die. Oh, they killed us again. If we were to live, that is not die. We had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. Grouch is a miserable guy. The brainstorm is a raging guy. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for the alcoholic, these things are poison. Killed us. We look back at our list for it held the key to the future. Oh, the first column. 
the list, the first column. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Okay. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us in the third column, my thinking all the time. In that state, the wrongdoings of others fancied or real, see, imagine, had the power to actually kill. I think they're doing something and it's got the power to kill me. How could we escape? We saw that we could not, you could not master these, we saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We couldn't wish them away any more than alcohol. Oh my God, I'm screwed. Then they tell us what they did. This was our course. This is what we did. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, like us. Though we didn't like their symptoms, top of page 67, and the way they disturbed us, the spiritual malady, the third column, they didn't, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us show them the same tolerance, which is not being judgmental of them. See, now I think pity has changed over time. I think pity now is sort of looking down on somebody, but I think this means this means compassion. They're the same as me. And patience. That would cheerfully grace a friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, This is a sick man or woman. How can I be helpful to him or her? God save me from being angry. Thy will be. We are not praying for them. We are praying for God to change us. That's very important. There is nothing wrong in praying for other people. But in the, in the nature of a resentment, which is going to kill me, I want God to change me so I don't have resentment anymore because I can't do that by myself. So this prayer is now a prayer that I will pray for the rest of my life. Every time I get a resentment. This is a sick person. How can I be helpful to them? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Not mine. Then it says... After saying that prayer, we avoid retaliation or argument. This is important. Don't retaliate. I used to retaliate. I used to argue. Not anymore. This is a new way. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. If we, can, we cannot be helpful to all people. But at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one by using that prayer. I've got to finish this next paragraph. Okay, this is great. Now, referring to our list again. Okay. So, let me just do this thing again. So, it was who, what they did, the cause, third column, next. Okay. So we've got our we've got our we've got our book. Here we go. We've got who cause effects third column. Okay. So now what we do we do something really solve the solve the first first part of the of the left hand column instead of folding it forwards we now fold it backwards. And as we fold it backwards, we move it over so it covers the two columns after it. So now all you have here is the name, and you cannot see what they did and what it affects. You now have one column and one blank column. The name in here, and now you have a column in order to write something in. When you don't can't see what they did and what it affects. This works, okay? 
because it says, you know, this is following directions in this paragraph. It says, we will be sick for labor. We just try to be in help, but we cannot be helped all people. At least God will show us how to kindly tolerant be. This next paragraph, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, second and third columns. That's why other than not putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done. We resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Notice it doesn't say character defects. It says mistakes. There's a series of questions now. And these questions require an answer. They don't, it's not a checkbox. You can't just pick a box and say, oh, I was resentful. No, no, no. If you read it, it says, where had we been selfish? That requires an answer. I have been selfish because I wanted that person to do what I wanted them to do. Where have I been dishonest? I was dishonest because I lied about whatever. Where have I been self-seeking? Oh, I manipulated that, manipulated that person to go and do something that I wanted them to do. They didn't particularly want to do, but I persuaded them. Self-seeking. Where are I afraid? Why am I afraid? Where have I been selfish? Where have I been dishonest? Where have I been self-seeking? Where have I been frightened? Write it down. Answer the question. Then it says, though the situation is not been entirely our fault, we try to disregard the other person entirely. Again, that's reminding us not to look at the second or third column, just the name. We admit it out and it says... <clears throat> Where were we to blame? That's the last question. Have I done something to this person in the past that has caused them to retaliate? And when they retaliate, I don't particularly like what they did. So I got a resentment towards them for retaliating for something that I did to them some time ago. Am I to blame? Did I upset them some way and they've, they've, they've upset me now and I've conveniently forgotten what I've done to them? And all I can think of is focusing on what they're doing to me. Present. So I write it down. What did I do to them? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. You see, in the second column, when you do the second column, that's the last time you're going to take their inventory. From now onwards, it's going to be yours. Alcoholics Anonymous teaches us to do our inventory, not, not theirs. So if I start taking someone else's inventory in my mind, I've got to stop it because it's blocking me from the spirit within. <clears throat> it says the inventory is out of the other man. We saw our faults. We listed them. We placed them before us in black and white, writing down again so on those questions. Committed our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. They're talking about the eighth step already. Here we are doing a fourth step, and they're talking about an eighth step. Set these matters straight. That means making an amend. <clears throat> then it says, notice the word fear. It's bracketed alongside the difficulties of Mr. Brown, Mr. Jones, the employer. Now we're finished. We're finished with the resentment, with the resentment inventory. Okay, we look, we finished with it. First three columns is what the way we now. Third column is a new way of thinking. Well, the fourth column, I beg your pardon, on page 67, is a new way of thinking. It's a selfless way of thinking. I'm looking at my own mistakes. It's a very it's a very difficult thing to do for an egotistic or selfish self self-centered alcoholic to do. But it is absolutely necessary if we are to live any, any kind of life. 
because harboring resentments kills us, drunk or sober. Now, I haven't got time to go into fear today, but we'll look at fear next week. But fear is not an inventory. Fear is a review. And there's a sex review after that. It's not an inventory. We've done the inventory. The inventory is looking at the way, the third column, looking at the way that we show up in life untreated. And fourth column is showing us what our stats are so that we can begin to change with God's help. It's extremely important. And it, it's, I've gone into great detail. It needs to be done in great detail because it's so important. This is the core of how we stay sober. This is the core of how we get over what is taking us back to drinking. It's this inventory process. And it's interesting when you look at the 12 steps on, um, on page 59, when we get to step four, it says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, meaning a truthful inventory. Then when we look at step 10, it says continued to take personal inventory. That means that we've done it before. Well, when have we done it before? We did it before in a fourth step. So they're teaching us how to do inventory in these pages in how it works. There's about seven pages that show us how to do a detailed inventory of our faults and mistakes that are, are blocking us from the power within that will keep us safe. Once we know how to do it, we can do it on the back of a back of an envelope. I've got a little, I've got a little pad here. It's a little pad. It's qu those are quarter sheets of, of printer paper. This is a printer paper. That is, uh, that is, it's stuff that I don't use anymore. And if I've got an, if I've got a if I've got an inventory at the end of the day when I'm doing 10 step, when I'm doing 11 step, I'll I'll write it down on here, and I'll do three columns on there, and I'll turn it over to the back, and I'll answer those questions on the back of the paper. And I've got to write it down because I've got to see it. If it stays in my head, it just goes round and round. Write it down. It only takes about five minutes. But I get to see my mistakes. It's really important. So, okay. So, uh, I'll, I'll quit there. I'll, get this, I'll simply go over time again. But anyway. Um, so thanks everyone for being here and thank you for listening and I hope that was useful and if nobody's told you they love you today God does and I do too and thank you so much for inviting me to do this because it's, it's, it's important to me as well thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.